All right. Let's get started with our next segment, which is all about women entrepreneurship. And I, um, I have to say, I'm so excited to be on this panel with these amazing women. who They're going to introduce themselves in a moment. I'm Cheryl Guerin. I manage marketing and communications for North America for MasterCard. And I'm really proud to be here to talk about this particular topic. Every day in the US, over 1,800 businesses are opened by women. And these women are generating over 1.7 trillion in sales. And they're not only generating sales for their businesses, they're contributing to the economy, and they're employing nearly 9 million people. Uh, and they're having a tremendous impact on certainly the economy and society. They're fierce, they're powerful, and they're making a real impact. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how they're doing that today. Uh, so I'm going to have each of you actually introduce yourselves and give a little bit of background on uh, your stories, how you went from idea to actual impact in starting your companies. So you want to start with, let's start with you. Sure. Before. Hi, I'm Deepa Guy. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Live Tinted. Um, we are a beauty brand focused on diversity and inclusion in the beauty industry. I grew up in Texas, um, Sugarland, Texas, and I was around a lot of people who I didn't see look like me. And so when I went into a grocery store and I was trying to buy beauty products, I um, wanted to change everything about myself. I dyed my hair blonde, I got blue contacts, and just, it, it was a really uh, triggering thing for me as a kid. And so I told myself when I was 16 and my very traditional South Asian parents that I wanted to start my own beauty brand. And they basically were like, no, you're gonna be a doctor. And that's, that's your only option. Um, and then I basically realized that the only way that I was gonna be able to do this is if I showed them that it was possible. And so I went to college, majored in marketing. And basically in my brain, I was like, okay, I'm gonna work for the biggest beauty brand in the world. I'm going to go to Harvard Business School and make my parents so happy and then start this brand. Um, I interned at uh, L'Oreal and then they didn't give me the full-time offer and I just thought my whole world was ruined. But everything happens for a reason and I ended up working at a beauty startup and while I was there I had a video go viral on YouTube. I used red lipstick under my eyes to mask dark circles and the internet was like, what are you doing? Um, and it went viral and I got asked to come on the Today Show to do this segment on air and I quit my job that day because I know, crazy, you sound like my parents, they also agreed, it was crazy. Um, and I think I just had this moment of it was now or never and sort of like you could turn that 15 minutes of fame into a cool moment in your life or into your dream career. And that's what I did and for the past, from 2015 to 2018, I was a beauty influencer with the mindset of I want girls growing up to finally see someone who looks like them represented in the beauty industry. And that was the same principle, thank you. Thank you. And that's sort of the principle that went into launching Live Tinted, and here I am today. We launched our first product a year ago, and it's just really cool to be able to build a company with that being the core and purpose of the brand. Um, everything from our board to investors to employees to every single campaign we um, execute, uh, diversity and inclusion is a core part of it. Wonderful. Rebecca? Hi, that's amazing. Hi. I'm Rebecca Park. I'm the co-founder and CEO of The Well, which is your complete ecosystem for wellness. We opened our flagship club on 15th Street about five months ago. And um, prior to founding The Well, uh, my early inspiration was really born out of a desire as a consumer to have a space like The Well. So we bring together Western medicine and Eastern healing across acupuncture and Ayurveda um, and yoga and mindfulness practices, but also functional medicine and nutrition and coaching. And um, early on when I started my career, I was working in finance, so I was on a trading desk and I was in early and out late and had very little time to navigate the city's disparate wellness offerings and I went to a spa in Sedona, Arizona and had this incredible integrative experience and was really inspired to bring destination wellness to an urban market. Um, I'd grown up around a lot of these modalities. My mom was teaching yoga when she was pregnant with me. Um, composting, growing organic vegetables, taking me to Tai Chi workshops. So I had some of the vernacular and the language, but 
as a 20-something living in New York, working at a bank, I couldn't figure out how to integrate it into my life. So my aha moment was sitting in the meditation room um, in this spa, and I just knew and thought in that second, I have to figure out how to bring this to New York. Um, but I think I certainly wasn't ready and didn't know what to do. I just sort of knew I would. And so that was the fall of 2009. And then I really spent the next several years walking around the world looking through the lens of, wouldn't this be great? And we could bring this, and we could do this, and we could bring these thought leaders together. And every experience I had, trip I took, um, all inspired this dream and this idea. And you know, by the time I was ready to start, I was really clear on exactly what I wanted to do. And I think that was sort of an important um, point. And that spanned six years, so it took a minute. Um, and then by the spring of 2015, I, I felt it was time, and I left my job. Um, I left finance in 2011. I started a healthcare nonprofit, so I was funding research um, to better understand the neurobiology of eating disorders and what's happening in the brain of men and women who get sick. And then from there, I started working for Deepak Chopra. So I was working for him as his COO and really started talking to doctors and practitioners and realized that not only did I want this experience as a consumer, um, but medical practitioners and healers really wanted to come together and learn and ideate and offer these integrated services um, to the community. So um, at that point, I quit my job and started working on it full time, and that's how The Well was born. That's great. And then Lindsay. Um, my name is Lindsay Taylor Wood. I'm founder and CEO of a company called The Helm. Um, and we make it easy to invest in women. And my backstory is that I had spent my career working in the um, women's rights space and uh, spent about a decade doing that, started a consulting company working with high net worths and family offices uh, and talent on gender lens philanthropic strategies. And in early 2016, I had this sort of unfortunate realization that you could pick virtually any metric by which to measure the success and advancement of girls systemically in the US, and we'd flatlined. Um, and I just couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around that. I couldn't continue to ask the people that I was working with to make these multi-year, multi-million dollar commitments to things when we weren't seeing the sorts of social returns that we wanted to see. And so at that point, I spent a year going on what I dub a listening tour and asking the question, why is philanthropy the only way we invest in equality? And the answers that I got back were obviously you know, far reaching and, and relative to the person I was in conversation with, but there was one key insight that was most catalytic to starting the company, and that was, as a general rule, when men have wealth, they're invited to invest and amass more wealth. Um, whereas when women have wealth, they're invited to give it away. And when I really started to unpack what that meant about how we were investing in and architecting the world we lived in, which is in its crudest sense, when white men of privilege are investing in their own self-interests, and then women are spending their money in terms of philanthropic capital, sort of cleaning up the mess and the unintended consequence of not taking all of us into account from the get-go, we end up in the same situation over and over and over. And so, um, and so I wanted to start a company that invited women to the table to, and men, we have amazing men as well, but invite women to the table to spend their capital differently um, and to meet them where they are. And so our current opportunities are a venture fund. Um, we invest in early stage companies with a female founder and CEO. Uh, and then we also have an e-commerce platform where we sell exclusively the products of women-led companies. So in the same way you would go to a Farfetch or a Goop or a net -a or wherever you may do your online shopping, um, we have a platform that has curated the most amazing emerging designers um, and some well-known designers as well that allows for you to drive capital through conscious consumerism with every purchase that you make. Yeah. Right. These ladies are so inspirational and I want you to learn something from each of them. And so I'm going to ask them a few questions. and. You talked about investments and funding, and uh, you know I have this question for Rebecca. In your previous role, you focused on actually getting federal funding uh, for integrative healthcare, right? Um, now, in your new, in your company, um, how do you go about securing funding, and what's your strategy and approach for securing the proper set of funding? Um, sure. Yeah. So. 
I think first and foremost, um, one thing I learned early on in my career is that fundraising is in and of itself a skill set. And certainly when you're starting a company, I think it's something that you need to be excited to do and prepared to do. And if not, my advice would be find a partner who is because it's part of the job and it's never ending. Um, when I first started out working in finance, I was fundraising for a hedge fund and private equity that were raising capital from pensions and endowments, and it was completely different. It was somebody else's capital. It was pitching somebody's investment thesis. When I was working with Deepak Chopra, and we were talking to federal agencies looking to secure government grants for research that he was doing, again, very different. It was nonprofit focused. It was um, a different experience, and the same with my time on the nonprofit side. Raising venture capital for your own business, um, I think, is its own beast. So let's start there in terms of the, uh, the tips or suggestions that I have um, and things that I learned from my experience. I would say, um, number one, my partners and I, from day one, really always approach fundraising um, and raising capital like we were raising a team. We were acutely aware of what expertise we needed at every stage. So early days, we were looking to secure real estate. We needed real estate expertise and guidance. We didn't have a credit history as a company. We knew it would be difficult to secure a lease. Um, so when we focused on our seed round, we were really looking for sophisticated, smart, thoughtful real estate investors to support us at that stage. Um, so think about raising capital like raising a team and know that it'll evolve based on your needs. Um, the second thing I would say is it's worth spending time really thinking about your corporate structure and your board composition. Um, having a fabulous board is so instrumental to a company's success, especially if the vision is ambitious and you have big plans to grow. Um, you know, I think you want to find board members that are deeply passionate about you and your vision and give you the space to lead and to grow, um, but able to guide you. Test your blind spots, test your thinking, or help you find your blind spots, and just encourage you to make difficult decisions and ultimately prepare the company for growth. Um, I think it's important to try to maintain operating controls and creative controls, though. So although you're looking for a board um, and investors that can really help you make tough decisions and give you guidance and expertise that you might not have, I do think it's important to be in control of your vision, especially at an early stage, um, because no one knows your business and your idea better than you do. So I think board composition matters. Um, the number of investors that you take in, so when you're raising money early days, um, you know, every single investor that writes you a check, whether it's a $1,000 check or a $10 million check, deserves your time, and just know that when you're trying to build and run a company, you're gonna have very little time, so be thoughtful about the number of investors um, you engage. And then, you know, I think when we were preparing for this talk, we talked a lot about the challenges unique to women raising capital, and you know, I definitely think two things that I learned, so I have two co-founders, um, and one is female and one is male, and one of the things that I learned from my male business partner early days was that you've got to be confident. And so when you're sitting in front of an investor, it is so easy, especially as a woman, to feel like they're doing you a favor by writing you a check. And he really encouraged me to realize that as a founder who's planning to put your heart and soul into building something, um, you're inviting somebody to go on this wild ride with you. And you're giving them an opportunity to support you and your idea and your business. And so um, I think it's really important to have confidence in that. And um, of course, be humble. Always be humble. That's good life advice. But um, be confident. And then be prepared to praise yourself. Also something that's hard, certainly for me. Um, you know, you have to realize that when somebody is looking to invest in your business, they're not just investing in your business model, but they're investing in you as a leader. And so when you're selling them on yourself, you have to be prepared to speak to your accomplishments, speak to your experience. You know, I think it's also important to talk about where you don't have experience and sort of how you plan to solve for those, um, those gaps in your skill set and hire around that. But ultimately, you have to be comfortable saying, this is what I'm good at, this is why I believe this, and this is why I'm uniquely positioned to execute on this vision. Um, and then lastly, I think one of the most important things we have to do as women um, and founders and funders is to pay it forward and help each other. Um, it is so hard to raise capital um, at this magnitude and this scale, at least that was my experience. You're gonna get a lot of no's um, and it's gonna take a lot of tenacity and you, especially as a woman, you know, it's a different conversation and so I think it's so crucial that when other women and founders are looking for advice, make the time and give advice, give guidance, share your success, share your failures, um, support each other. I think that that's just the only way we're gonna shift the conversation. That's great. 
You know, one of the things that, uh, that we started at MasterCard is we, we wanted to shine a light on these most women like you, and in fact, Deepika here is featured in our campaign. It's called Her Idea Start Something Priceless. And the whole, what we want to do is we see this, 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 this issue. 2% of all VC funding goes to women-owned companies. And we want to show the impact that all of these businesses are having. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. So we featured uh, Deepika and her company, Live Tinted. And in fact, um, you know, your company, you, st you told your story, which, yeah. you know, blew up on uh, YouTube and others. And, uh, and then you were on the Today Show as well with, uh, with what you did with your red lipstick trick. And uh, so from this, you started a company that was founded on content, and community, yeah. and this costs money to create content and sure. uh, build a community. And so, how do you how, how did you decide to go that route? And then, how do you how do you make and monetize what you're doing in order to keep your business going? Yeah, and I remember when I went and spoke to VCs in the early days, they were like, "Why are, why are you starting as a community? You already have a brand around yourself personally." And I kept saying to them, "It's important to me that this brand isn't about me, and it's about a larger community than myself." And nobody got it. And it's kind of one of those things that people don't know something until they see it. And going back to the paying it forward thing, for me, the path that I took was instead of going to VCs, I went to strategic angel women in my life who have really made success for themselves and wanted to invest in other women. And I think that's a really incredible route to go in the early days. I'm, I'm, I mean, we're a year and a half in and I feel very glad that we went that way because there's not a lot of noise in my head because a lot of times, and you know, it's not always the case, but VCs come with a lot of demands and things that they, you have to answer to. And for me, going to individual women, they're just rooting for me. And they just like want to see me win. So they're not like, you know, asking for all these reports and things like that, which is really overwhelming when ain't nobody got time in the early, especially, <laughs> especially in the early days when you're just like trying to figure everything out. So, you know, I went, I literally asked Bobby Brown, I was like, do you invest in companies? Are you an advisor for any company? And she was like, nobody's asked me. And I was like, I'm asking you. <laughs> um, and she's an investor in my company now. And yeah, it was really cool. It was really cool because to me, she's the first beauty brand that really did diversity and inclusion and it was a white Jewish woman, you know? And I think that's really cool that she knew it was important. And so anyways, my point is that I went to Strategic Angel Checks to get a small amount of money in to start this business as a community because it was really important to me that we did. And every single day we told a different narrative of women focusing on their identity, their culture, and really making it so you saw storytelling as the forefront of this brand. And that's when we asked them, it's like we were saying this yesterday, but everyone's trying to do all this fancy market research when you can just do a poll on Instagram and figure out what people want. Um, and we asked them and they told us that um, hyperpigmentation was their number one beauty concern. And I was like, well, between a video that went viral and the community three years later telling me that we needed to create a solution for it. And then so after a year of talking to the community, we launched our first product because I truly believe that the best way to extend the community message is through a physical product that people can touch. Um, and so that's why we launched the Hue Stick and an amazing campaign. And this is the other cool part is that we co I could never afford to have a billboard in Times Square or a page in the New York Times. like. That would just not be a thing. It was so legit priceless <laughs> that that opportunity came. They did not tell me to say that, <laughs> but it really was priceless. Like I, I, and manifestation is so real. I put into the universe one day, we will have a New York Times ad and we ended up having it on our launch day because of MasterCard. Surreal. It was crazy. That, that's why we're doing this. It's priceless to us actually. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, Lindsay, so I'm going to go back to your story because incredible, the helm, you, you, you decided to launch this business was so critical. You wanted to see change happen and you were not seeing it happen um, soon enough. Why did you decide at this moment it was so critical to get this business going and do something different uh, than your path that you were, you were on? Yeah, I mean, I think you touched on it. It's really, it was just impatience. It was having spent, I mean, I'm sure, you know, it's it's an interesting question in a moment when we saw Warren drop out of the race yesterday, right? Like how many women right now feel that no matter what they do, we just can't seem to break the ceiling, right? Like, 
And I think having spent a decade working on those issues in a very specific way, I had reached my personal, intellectual, spiritual, emotional capacity with that theory of change. And I needed to explore what else there was. And so, you know, in investigating what other opportunities there were for investing in women, I came across, you know, so many opportunities, but the two that were these huge arbitrage opportunities were one, which you touched on earlier, just over 2% of venture capital going to women, which is essentially 98% of all of our innovation is led by men, I mean, is the other side of that, right? Um, and then also, we had found some data that said, um, the, the, this one is from Walmart, interestingly enough, but that said 90% of women would go out of their way to buy products and services that are from women-led companies if they knew where to find them. And there wasn't anywhere to find them, and so we built that as well. And I think one interesting sort of side note is, you know, sometimes it's, it's actually overwhelming to talk about the company because I feel we're solving for so many things. We're democratizing access to capital, we're focusing on founders, we're focusing on funders. Um, but what we also discovered in building the e-com piece of the company is this real opportunity to speak to all of the other parts of a woman's life. So not just fashion and not just beauty, but what are the products and services for women who are having trouble with fertility or who are looking towards menopause or who want more, you know, product sort of... Um, around their careers or whatever it may be, right? And so really looking at the entirety of a woman's life and figuring out the different ways that we could storytell around that, that we could elevate women who were creating solutions in those spheres. Um, and so we are also unfurling a new content platform in the next couple of weeks that's helmed by um, an incredible, our incredible head of content, Olivia Fleming. Um, and we look forward to elevating those women's stories as well so that for people who maybe don't have that discretionary income, don't have those extra dollars for, um, you know, consumerism, aren't at a place in their career where writing an angel check is the thing that they can do. They can just start from a place of actually what you were speaking to earlier, which is learning about who is in the space, what are the best practices that they've gleaned from starting these companies and starting to educate themselves and have greater insight into what it looks like to be both a founder and a funder in this space. That's great. Okay, so, uh, you know, there's a statement that I think I'm going to say it and then we should ban it. But I don't know how many times I've heard people say or have even said to me, during my career. Be careful for what you wish for. Be careful in what you wish for. Uh, because it just might happen. And then what happens when it happens? You're going to have to work even harder, right? We should ban this statement. We should just keep dreaming, keep pushing, and go for it, right? And uh, that's what you're all doing. But I want to talk about that particular thing. When you move to the next stage and you actually are successful, you start to scale a business. And when that business scales, it's like starting another business again. You have resource needs, technology needs, people needs, uh, everything changes. So how do you deal with that? What do you do? What kind of advice can we give them so we don't have to worry about that statement ever again? Uh, I'll, I'll actually start with Lindsay this time. So it's an interesting question because we were speaking about this backstage and it's, it's so contingent on like, what kind of company do you have? What is the stage of your company? What is the specific thing that you're up against at any given moment, right? And so I think that in terms of advice or what I think about, it's really one thing, and we were also saying that <laughs> um, it's hard to give these really specific you know, pragmatic solutions to a general audience because the answer is they are cliches in the sense that like they are basic things. And for me, I just keep coming back to keep going. Uh, and I say this all the time, Jean Brownhill, who's uh, the founder and CEO of a company called Sweeten, when I was asking her something similar once, and she probably doesn't even remember telling me this, was talking about the dearth of capital, how hard it was, how challenging it was to find, you know, all of the things that she needed to make her company great and succeed and that when you're on the floor and you really feel like you cannot keep going it's the one thing that really is in my head all the time um, because 
the other things are so, they're, they're, it's a moving target, right? Like one day you're like, my needs are, I have a person who's gonna quit my team and oh my God, what am I gonna do? Or how do I make my culture stronger? Or how do I find additional capital? Or how do I make sure that my investors have the information they need while also understanding the realities of what I'm up against? And each of those things is a different book, a different mantra, a different saying, a different piece of advice. So I think the larger umbrella sort of philosophy that I keep coming back to is just to keep getting up and keep showing up over and over and over because there have been way more moments than not when it would have been easier to not get up. It's never easy. Yeah. Never, it's never easy. That's right. Rebecca, tell us. Um, I couldn't agree more. And I think that I often joke, you know, had I known how ambitious this vision was, I never would have started. So I think ignorance can be bliss in the beginning, um, just in terms of how uh, big and overwhelming um, building a business and scaling a business can be. I think that, um, you know, we as a company, you know, we're, we have a very ambitious vision. We're working to transform the way that we think about our health. You know, we are a big team and we're working to change healthcare delivery mechanisms. Um, we're working to empower our community to take greater agency for their health and well-being, and that means a thousand different things to a thousand different people. Um, wellness is really topical and trendy right now, but it's a big word, and it means different things to different people. So, you know, I think as you were saying earlier, some of it, it can be overwhelming sometimes because you're trying to articulate, we do this, and we do this, and we do that. It's like we're trying to hold space for really big ideas for lots of people that impact um, a broad audience in a lot of different ways. So thinking about how to scale a business from a club in New York City versus a consumer product line that's available throughout the world, a digital platform and content that's unique and interesting and powerful, and e-learning for communities all over the world, they're all different businesses, you know? So I think, tactically speaking, um, the first thing that we think about, well, it's two main things. One is your infrastructure. So just like building a house, you've got to build a strong foundation and go from there. So slow and steady in the beginning, know where you're trying to go and figure out how to build the base and you can grow from there. And then it's the team. I mean, we grew from, this time last year we were 12 people and today we're 180. And Congratulations. thank you. Um, and so each person is smarter and more incredible than the next. So I think surround yourself with really seasoned experts, but um, especially as a founder, I think it's important not just to hire the right people, but to trust the right people. So empowering other people, learning from them, um, getting out of the way when you have to. But, um, but yeah, don't be, don't be scared. Just keep going day by day. Break it into bite-sized pieces because um, you can get through step by step. I think for me, um, the thing I can speak to is there was this constant pressure to grow and quicker and faster and the next headline and when's the next launch? Like, what's the next product? When are you going to be in a Sephora? And that like noise in your head of keep growing, growing, growing. And I think the biggest thing I can say is to grow at your own speed instead of someone else's speed or what you think other people, what you're supposed to do because somebody said you're supposed to do it. Um, and so that's something that in real time I'm going through right now is, man, like I, we, we literally launched a product yesterday and I'm, everyone's like, so what's next? And, I, and I'm like, it was yesterday, can I enjoy this moment? And I think that if you grow too quickly, you're also not taking in the moments of, I, I don't know who said this. It's probably DVF because she says all the cool things. But um, it was about like enjoying the journey. Like we're always so focused on the next accomplishment and growing, growing, growing. But like, what about the right now? I'm living my dream right now. So I think you kind of have to find this balance of, of course, we're a business. We want to scale. We want to grow. And we want to make a bigger impact in the world. But also recognizing to do it on your terms rather than somebody else's. That's great. So we have a minute left, and so I know everybody discussed their book. So I'm going to say, I'm going to do uh, ask you guys which book do you um, advise everybody to get, read, keep on their nightstand. Um, I just finished Dare to Lead by Brene Brown, and I thought that was really helpful. I also would say Making of a Manager by Julie, I believe Zhu, was really helpful in thinking about how to scale um, and create a healthy, thriving culture. Um, I have to go. I know it's on brand and maybe cliched, but I have to say the Yoga Sutras. So that is a dog-eared book that has been on my nightstand for decades. Um, and 
when I read it, I feel like I have this secret answer that I need to share with the world because I feel like it's a playbook for life. So whenever I have a question, I go back to the Yoga Sutras and I find the answer. So there's this book called Atlas of Beauty that's been gifted to me by three different friends after launching Live Tinted. And I get why, because every single photo, it's a coffee table book, but I I think everyone should have it in their home because you flip through the pages and it's the most raw, real beauty of photos of women all around the world. And it's so inspiring to see that. And I think that needs to be kind of what the world's reflecting more of. Great. I want to thank these amazing women in charge uh, for being here with us today. Uh, thank you. Absolutely inspirational. Thank you very much. Thank you.